Mark. Okay, so um, uh, uh, so for me, uh, the study of ambi twisters goes back a long time to my thesis. The um, uh, in the um, when I was studying it back in the uh, well, it, it was introduced in the um, uh, 70s by uh, Witten and by Eisenberg, Yaskin, and Green as a uh, route to extending Roger Penrose's twister constructions for self-dual fields to sort of general fields so that the twister constructions could have some non-trivial uh, non -trivial <coughs> application to physics. And um, uh, although the formulation was found in four dimensions of the field equations by uh, Wisson and by Asberg, Yeskin and Green, and it was extended to a certain extent to conformal and Einstein gravity in four dimensions by uh, 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 well, by Lebrun and sort of work uh, uh, that I did with in my thesis, the um, uh, uh, it sort of foundered for about um, uh, sorry, I, 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 my mental arithmetic isn't very good in front of people. Maybe 30 years or something. And um, uh, but in the last two years, the uh, 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 the ambi twisters have really come back again. And this was really um, uh, initiated by some remarkable formulae found by Freddy Cachazzo, Song He, and uh, Ellis Yuan for tree-level S matrices, um, which really worked in all dimensions for uh, gravity and Yang Mills and so on. And, um, uh, and so these, these hung around for a bit, sort of waiting for some interpretation. And David found a, a, a cute word, world sheet model, and, uh, and, and so David and I sort of uh, figured out that these things were um, string theories uh, in ambi-twister space. And in fact, that the ambi-twister theory was, to a certain extent, driving uh, uh, the um, <coughs> underpinning features of these remarkable formulae uh, given by um, Freddy Cachazzo, Song He, and Ellis Yuan. And so these are the things that I'm going to describe to you, for you today. Um, so there are now many of these theories for, uh, for many space-time theories. And so I'll, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about that. But um, I think, given the interests of the group here, I want to focus more on the Einstein model and uh, tell you about how they relate to um, asymptotic symmetries, to null infinity, and um, also uh, uh, to the loop integrand for um, uh, maximal supergravity. So just in a nutshell, what are these theories? Well, these theories are related to conventional string theory. So conventional string theory is, uh, of course, famous for the way in which it um, combines together all of the Feynman diagrams of field theory uh, into uh, just one uh, uh, sort of conceptually relatively simple object uh, obtained from quantizing a two-dimensional field theory uh, on a Riemann surface of maps from the string into um, space-time. Now, of course, uh, string theory brings along a whole lot of other extra stuff. You have all the massive modes as well. And uh, if you're interested just in the field theory and not in the kind of full string theory, uh, it's well known that you've got to take an alpha prime goes to zero limit. And this was done by uh, uh, various people over the years, by Zvian friends in the uh, uh, 80s and 90s. And, and what they discovered was that the Riemann surfaces sort of fragment up back into sort of things that look like Feynman diagrams again. And so as soon as you go back to field theory, you find that you're um, ending up with uh, a, a field theory Feynman diagram-like description with all the complexity that that entails. So what these um, uh, ambi-twister strings uh, seem to do, though, is they manage to keep the kind of string theory uh, simplicity uh, 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 whilst throwing away the higher mass uh, spectrum of the string world sheet models. So these are string theories essentially at alpha prime equals zero, infinite tension, and, um, uh, uh, and, and they, that their um, particle spectrum is just ordinary field theory. They don't have any of the extra stuff of conventional strings. Now, of course, with that, of course, comes also the divergences of conventional field theory. They also, I mean, they, they, these things do just give um, what you expect of ordinary field theory. So, um, uh, so there's a calculation that you can do, which I, 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 won't, I, I haven't written down, whereby you can just take the ordinary bosonic string and you can 
uh, uh, put it into first order form so you can um, you can write down, for example, uh, you know, if you've got um, a string uh, world sheet sigma and you've got a holomorphic coordinate uh, a little sigma on the world sheet, then that, then you can write down p equals d by d sigma of x and um, p bar is d by sig d sigma bar of x. And then you can sort of scale things with alpha prime and take an alpha prime goes to zero limit. And um, uh, uh, so, so I guess if you do that in a um, uh, way that respects <coughs> sort of reality structures, uh, then you get something that's going to end up looking a bit like a word line. Uh, but um, if, you, if you allow yourself to um, uh, let things become complex, then you... Um, then you let up, uh, that what, what you can end up with is this uh, uh, action here uh, for a chiral string. But um, what you notice here is that uh, if, you, if you vary, um, for example, uh, uh, x, you'll get that d bar p equals zero. So p has to be, um, so d bar is, of course, just, uh, uh, just meant to be d sigma bar times d by d sigma bar, and similarly for d. And so what you discover is that the field equations are going to tell you that d bar of x is zero. Uh, if x was a real, that means that x is holomorphic, but if x was real, then um, uh, it would have to be constant. You get a trivial um, theory. So you have to uh, uh, allow the space-time coordinates to become complex in order for this to be a, um, a, a non-trivial um, object. So you end up complexifying space-time and so that means you allow all the coordinates to become complex, and uh, you assume that the metric is analytic. And so the metric, uh, if you're thinking of this on a curved background, would become a holomorphic function of the complex coordinates. How are you supposed to get them back to real space-time? So, the, um, so, so, so you, you, you don't need to forget that you have a real slice, but this string will wander off into the complex. But if, if we want a theory that lives on the real slice, so to speak, is this just not well adapted to that, or uh, what, what do we do? So if you want a theory that's just on the real slice, there are, there are ways of taking limits. So the idea here is that um, to make life easy, you assume that the metric is analytic and you can complexify a little way. But um, uh, in the limits, you still have a mathematical structure that's well defined, but it's less comfortable to work with. You have what's called a Cauchy-Riemann structure, and... Um, uh, th th there is a lot that can be said about that, but um, uh, yeah, but it's easier just to work in this complexified framework. So, um, okay, so this is this this is what you end up with, and uh, I, I've suppressed this e here is what's left of the metric if you start with the Polykov action. Uh, I, there's actually an e tilde which I'm not bothering with here at the moment, and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so that there's, there's a kind of the chiral version of world sheet gravity. And what happens here is that this E ends up... Um, well, for this to make sense, first of all, the momentum has to be a one form on the world sheet. It's a um, uh, holomorphic one form, so you, you imagine that P is really coming with its uh, D sigma as well. And um, the... Uh, then these other fields here, the E has whatever weights it needs to make sense. And uh, when you vary E, you, you find that uh, P squared is vanishing. So this P is actually has to be a null vector. This P squared is just what you get by contracting P with itself with the metric. Uh, and you also find that this E plays a dual role as a, a gauge field for a gauge freedom which um, translates you in X up and down the uh, null vector generated by P. So here now I'm working in flat space, just to, just to say it this simply. So, um, so, so what, what the picture one has then, just uh, you see, uh, despite the fact we complexify, we can still sort of draw real pictures in the sense that a, a, a complex one manifold you still draw as a curve. I mean, the algebraic geometers do that the whole time. The instance properties work in just that, the way you'd expect for that. So uh, P is translating you up and down the null G physics, and uh, E has some gauge transformation. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. That should be okay. 
Okay, so, 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 so in fact, what this theory is describing is not so, so much a theory in, in space-time, but first of all, p squared has to be uh, null. Sorry, p, p squared has to be zero, so p is, is null. And uh, this gauge freedom is, is, is telling you that p is defining you in null, null direction and that the, um, if you were to actually sort of just take this as a classical action and quotient out by the gauge freedom, then you're actually left with the space of null geodesics. So that is to say that the true degrees of freedom are the space of complex null geodesics. But, yeah, complexified. Okay, so what we're going to do later is to think about amplitudes, um, uh, computing amplitudes according to the standard string algorithm, starting with this action or its, um, uh, you know, we'll add some world sheet matter and so on just to so get things. Excuse me, when you say complexified light like rays, uh, P and lambda P are the same thing. Is that correct? Or uh, okay, so... Um, Yes, essentially, uh, but I'm, I'm actually here working with scaled light rays, so I'm going to allow a scale, and in fact, if you, if you want to sort of quotient out by the uh, length or the extent of P, then I'll, I'll put a P in front of A for projectivization. I see, so this is not projectivized. So this is not projectivized at this point. For the mathematical theorems, you need to quotient by the scaling to get a compact uh, object. So why would you say geodesics? Um, well, okay, so I guess in, in flat space, this is, this, this, this is a geodesic. But, of course, this sigma here is, is a map into, um, is not a complex null geodesic itself. So the sigma itself will, will, it will be some um, uh, surface, uh, so, so some Riemann surface sitting inside A, and um, uh, that, that would then, uh, could be represented as a whole bunch of geodesics in space-time according to the choice of gauge that you want to make. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so this, the, uh, so, so, so this takes us, um, or this, this is meant to be motivation just to re re reprise some of the um, motivation that Roger Penrose used to uh, give for um, twister theory and also just some of the structure that one, uh, one uses to um, uh, uh, un understand what's going on in twister theory. So, uh, so I, I claim that what I just wrote down was the string theory in Amley twister space uh, and um, uh, Roger Penrose's idea was that this space of... Um, uh, well, for him it was twister space, and he was thinking real, so twister space contains the real light rays, but he was also often led to complexify and so on. And he wanted to argue that, um, uh, that, that one should actually focus on the space of null geodesics as a primary geometrical framework in which to express physics. And um, uh, he wanted to regard space-time as being derived. I mean, quite often when people talk about quantum gravity, they want to talk about... Uh, uh, space-time as being in some sense immersion since Roger's idea was that um, uh, uh, you should regard space-time as immersion from the space of uh, uh, light rays. And um, the way in which it should emerge is that um, uh, space-time events are determined essentially by their light cones. Now their light cones give rise to a um, subset of the space of multi physics, this X here inside A, and, um, uh, you know, so for example, in, uh, the, the, well, this is, this is generally speaking a, ju just, just the, the space of um, uh, P squared, uh, P such that P squared equals zero uh, at a point X. So that's what. And, um, uh, and then, the idea was that you could reconstruct space-time as the space of these uh, celestial quadrics, is the name that's often been preferred for them. It's a, it's a quadratic set, p squared equals zero, inside uh, the cotangent uh, bundle. So, um, so, so the point is that the uh, space of complex null geodesics um, uh, uh, is such that uh, if you now projectivize, then these uh, Quadrics are compact, uh, complex submanifolds, 
and you can ask how many uh, are there in the Ambi Twister space, and you discover that you get a d dimensional space time uh, manifold out just by looking at the space of these light rays. Uh, so, sorry, space of these celestial quadrics. And um, uh, the reason why there's only a d-dimensional family comes from uh, deep theorems and mathematics about compact, complex submanifolds uh, sitting inside a uh, larger space. So you can perturb them, and you discover that you only get a d-dimensional family, except in three dimensions. What's the dimension of that submanifold? It's one-dimensional complex. So okay, so in uh, so, so this 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 um, capital X is actually. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so in d dimensions, p squared equals zero is d minus one. If you're taking out the scale, then it's d minus two. So it's uh, d minus two dimensional complex manifold. So the um, okay. So that's the uh, uh, um, uh, the, the basic idea that, that you can reconstruct space time out of these quadrics and you can um, uh, uh, reconstruct the conformal structure by saying that if two of these uh, quadrics intersect at a point, then the two corresponding points must be separated by a light ray and the, uh, that means that you know when they're null connected and you can reconstruct the conformal structure. And it turns out that all you need to specify is the complex structure of this ambi-twister space. So um, that statement, I guess, uh, um, so this, this, this was uh, proved by Claude Lebrun, uh, following on from Penrose's original nonlinear graviton. And uh, the uh, basic idea then is that the metric is um, encoded in the complex structure of ambi-twister space and that the correspondence is stable under small deformations. So, um, so how do you actually uh, make that work in practice? So here's meant to be space-time. You have two points on an algeodesic. They correspond to two of these quadrics that um, intersect in a point. And uh, uh, just very schematically, you might do this in fat space. You then take a, um, uh, uh, a neighborhood of a point in this space. Then you can ask about deforming the, this ambitwist space, which, is the, um, uh, uh, which contains this quadric here. And the way you deform this is, is by uh, just changing the overlap functions in, in the complex manifold. So you're piecing it together out of two open sets. You shift one relative to the other. And um, uh, what you discover is that the quadric is now no longer lining up. But there's one nearby which does line up, but it's no longer flat. It's curved. And uh, you can then uh, ask about the intersection properties of these quadrics. And you can reconstruct in this new... Um, space, the uh, conformal structure. I'm sorry. Where did the symplectic potential come in? I so, okay, I was just about to talk about the symplectic potential. The complex structure. So, um, so the symplectic potential comes in if you want to make sure that you haven't introduced any torsion into the space-time. So the um, theorem that Claude Lebrun proved was that um, uh, the, that you have to preserve the symplectic potential, this p dot dx, if you want to um, uh, ensure that you're actually getting just a conformal structure, not a conformal structure, together with torsion. Now, that's, uh, mathematically, that's very nice. It means that the, um, these shifts in the uh, overlap functions uh, are all going to be uh, given by generating functions. So rather than thinking about a whole vector field, you just have a Hamiltonian which generates that. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of conscious that this is all unfamiliar territory for most people here, and I sort of maybe quite keen to move on, really, just because uh, uh, I think. Can I just ask one question? Does this mean that you're constructing only analytic um, space-time metrics by this method? Yes, although as I say, the, there is a limiting construction in which you shrink down the. Uh, um, radius of convergence to nothing. Uh, but then what you tend to find is that these ambitwister spaces have what's called a CR structure. And, and they're, they're mathematically perfectly well-defined, but you can still um, 
work with them. And but the theorems are often uh, a little little um, less easy to. Um, Would your metric have zeros? Sorry. Would your metrics have zeros? Uh, d but by, by zeros you mean uh, d d d d d does the uh, determinant vanish? Yeah. yeah. So what can happen actually is sorry the. Um, uh, what can happen is that you get what are called um, jumping, uh, the, the, the normal bundle can jump, and the geometric structure can degenerate. Uh, so uh, it, it could have zeros, it could degenerate, uh, it could develop singularities. The, uh, okay. But only a very special type. So one of the motivations for these ideas was that. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not really going to do, quite do this, but one of the motivations for this idea was that the, um, uh, if you uh, quantize in the um, twister space or in the ambi-twister space, then uh, you, you're um, keeping very well defined the notion of a light ray, uh, but um, uh, the concept of a space-time event becomes fuzzy. So that the... Um, uh, you know, you, you want to reconstruct these quadrics, but actually reconstructing them becomes messy. Uh, uh, it becomes subject to quantum uncertainties. Whereas if you just follow the standard st strategy where you quantize on space-time, components of the metric have some commutation relations and your light cone becomes fuzzy. Could you explain uh, the, the, what's the, the difference between twister and ambi-twister? So ambi-twister is like just the right-handed Part. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, so what it is, is, is I mean, so One is you, you see, what, what, what I'll say later is that the twister string was really an ambi-twister string. So the, uh, tw the ambi-twister space is the cotangent bundle of twister space. And um, uh, so quite often when you think about a string theory with a, with, with, with a given target space, uh, uh, you... Well, it's probably easier if I say say that say that a bit later. But it's uh, in four dimensions you, uh, you you have these alternative realizations of ambi twister space that express twi twist orally, and um, uh, the so so this is a question as to whether you want to um, uh, solve the constraint p squared equals zero and work on some representation where 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 that constraint is solved, or whether you want to just work with the p x formulation that uh, I was showing you earlier. Um, well, okay, no, but the, the distinction between twisters and ambi-twisters are that um, the, um, yeah, uh, in, in, in four <coughs> dimensions, uh, ambi-twister space is, is five-dimensional, twister space is three-dimensional, three uh, and, and the ambi-twister space is the projective cotangent bundle of the twister space. And, and it's all, it, it, it is all... Um, in play in the twister string. It's just that the dual twister coordinates become uh, 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 zero on the shell. So, so you forget about half the coordinates. So I'm not sure that answers that very clearly. OK, so uh, I, I just wanted to give that old-fashioned bit of motivation from twist, twister theory, which is probably maybe has some historic interest to um, Gary, who, who <laughs> saw Roger Sweet <laughs> so often these things for, for many years. But it's... Um, what I want to now do is just to get back into this um, string model and, and just talk a little bit about what you can do with this and how, uh, the different ways you can think about it. So, um, so what I've done here is I've actually sort of thrown in just an extra uh, uh, little bit here. So w when we took the alpha prime goes to zero limit, we had the um, quadratic differentials on, uh, uh, coming from the metric on both sides, the E and the E, e tilde, and uh, the E tilde behaves very much like a world sheet, a chiral version of world sheet gravity. The E here, as I said before, becomes a Lagrange multiplier for the P squared. So if you want to quantize this, then you gauge fix with E and E tilde zero, you introduce ghosts, and you have some BRST operator, and you worry about whether Q squared is vanishing or not. And you discover that this has the same uh, anomaly structure as the bosonic string. It's critical in 26 dimensions. And um, uh, you then introduce vertex operators that correspond to field perturbations and compute amplitudes as correlators of these vertex operators. So, 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 that's, uh, so I'm not going to give you the full calculations of all of that, but this is just the general strategy. 
And uh, the sort of thing that you have to do to make contact with amplitudes you might be interested in are to, uh, are to include sort of various um, amounts of world sheet matter. So if you just want to do gravity, um, uh, if, well, if you want to do, in fact, it'll end up being type 2 supergravity, uh, we, we had to add um, some world sheet supersymmetry. So the X uh, has, a, has a two lots of psi that go with it. And um, this is gauged as well, so there's some supersymmetry there. And um, uh, that also goes into the gauge fixing and ghosts and everything. And you get a theory that's critical in 10 dimensions. So, um, Lionel? Yeah. Can you say something about why these E's are gauge fixed to zero, why that makes sense? I guess I, I was thinking of E as some basically component of the metric, and if they're both zero, it sounds like I'm saying the metric is totally degenerate. Well, they're, they're the off-diagonal parts of the metric to a certain extent. So um, E, so, 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 so if, you, if you think about uh, uh, the Polyakov sort of strategy, then G has um, three components. And, um, uh, but we're also working complex. So, so, so e, e, e is roughly speaking the kind of dz, dz part, dz oh, squared part, and the e tilde starts life maybe as a dz tilde part. And, uh, yeah. Uh, although they both get shifted over to being uh, fields of the same character in, in this limit. Okay, so, uh, so, so the, the, the thing that... Um, so at this point, this all looks like standard string theory uh, to, a, to a large extent. And so you might ask, where is it that the ambitwisters are sort of playing a role? And they, they, they play a significant role in the choice of the vertex operators. So I'll just go through this in the bosonic um, string theory case. So, um, so the graviton then are meant to correspond to vertex operators, and at least for an integrated vertex operator, I mean, you have integrated and fixed vertex operators, but for the integrated vertex operator, you think of them as deformations of the action. And the action was essentially the integral of this um, p dot uh, d bar x, and uh, uh, we, we recognize this essentially as being the um, uh, this symplectic potential, the, the p dot dx, just restricted to the anti-holomorphic direction on the Riemann surface. And, um, and so you have to ask how it is that that varies when you uh, change the metric. Now, your first, um, your first uh, uh, um, reaction when you see that is that that doesn't depend on the metric. So... Uh, so what, what's going on? How, how can you make that depend on the metric? Well, uh, the point is you shouldn't think of this as, as just coming from a p dot dx uh, space-time formula. You should think of this as, as being this um, symplectic potential that lives on uh, ambient twister space. And um, as such, it actually turns out that it determines the complex structure on ambient twister space. So to know what the complex structure is, you need to know what all of the anti-holomorphic directions are and it's enough to know a holomorphic volume form. And um, uh, that annihilates all the anti-holomorphic directions. And uh, uh, so because this is a potential for this symplectic structure, you get a non-degenerate object by taking theta and wedging it with a, uh, uh, with a, a maximal power of d theta. And uh, that gives you a top degree holomorphic form. So that actually determines the whole of the complex structure. So um, if you want to have a complex structure that has such a uh, symplectic potential, then, and that was what Lebrun's theorem told you that you need to have, you need to vary the complex structure in such a way that the existence of the symplectic potential was uh, uh, maintained, then it's enough to know how it is that that symplectic potential itself is varying. And in fact, this is a... a issue of how it varies up to diffeomorphism, so this actually determines, you're really interested in this up to gauge where, where you add on d-bar or something. So, um, so, so, so in the Lebrun theorem, we had ambitrisor space being glued together with some uh, generating function or generating Hamiltonian H, and uh, uh, that was not a global thing, but the delta theta does have to be global. So you express d delta theta as d bar of this uh, gluing function, and that's now hopefully a global object. 
Lionel, um, do, do you also reconstruct the conformal factor of space-time from the complex structure, or only the <laughs> conformal structure? Uh, well, okay, in the LeBrun theorem, you only reconstruct the conformal structure, but there's all sorts of things in the... Um, uh, uh, in, in this which will break conformal invariance. The extra world sheet matter will and the, cons the constraints well, it, it, well yeah. So the, At this level though when you're talking about the vertex operator being related to how the action deforms when you change the metric, is it that you're only changing the conformal metric at this point? Or are you only, is this yeah. so, so, so this part of the theory is really just talking about conformal structures and we'll only really talk about sort of metrics when we have all the extra Type two world sheet supersymmetry. And, uh, I guess that sort of builds in at the level of the vertex operator the fact that the graviton doesn't care about the conformal factor somehow. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you see, the bosonic theory itself is pathological. It leads to sort of uh, amplitudes that, that uh, really don't uh, make very good sense. Even at tree level. Even at tree level, yeah. So the. Um, a three-point amplitude is, is like an R-cubed um, term. It has, it has the wrong number of derivatives in it for Einstein gravity. And that's cured by going to the type 2 super, super symmetric model. Can I just ask one other technical thing? What is theta to the d minus 2? Sorry, that's only d theta to the d minus 2. So, so you're d just taking d theta to the top power to get a top degree form. Oh, thank you. What's L? Uh, Oh, damn! Sorry, that's probably from a previous thing. That's just the so 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 theta has some um, uh, scaling weight, and um, uh, L is a line bundle that measures that scaling weight. So it's just things. It's just homogeneity weight in the p. So so, so it's something that has homogeneity degree one in rescaling the momentum is is something that takes balance in this line bundle. Okay, so I didn't want to be too abstractly mathematical. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping I can try and give you a sort of um, uh, uh, a view as, uh, uh, as to what this delta theta should look like by thinking uh, more concretely. If you have a variation in the metric that's just given by a momentum eigenstate, and here I've done this thing that we often do in color kinematics of factorizing the um, polarization of the uh, Graviton, so to speak, into a product of a two epsilons. And um, so, uh, uh, so, 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 the, the, so how are we going to actually um, uh, write down a vertex operator corresponding to this variation of the metric? Well, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to think about um, how it is that this leads to you needing to glue together the ambitwister space in a different way. And... Um, so, so the picture was that um, that will lead to some shift in the gluing of ambitwister space. And uh, now P squared is what generates the, the null geodesics. And th this... Could you write higher on the board? Yeah, I'll just rub out some, some stuff. If I can go over this side. Would it be too dark if I write here? You can flip yeah. that there like the left switch. So, um, so if your metric is G equals eta plus um, uh, uh, plus plus epsilon uh, epsilon, then the um, uh, uh, p squared will go to sort of um, p uh, uh, you know, the flat well, G P P will 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 be p uh, um, uh, eta plus the um, eti k dot x. Uh, epsilon dot p squared and uh, um, now what we um, have to imagine is that we're going to um, uh, 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 glue together the uh, ambitwister space by um, uh, integrating up the um, effect of this metric perturbation along the um, uh, light ray, and uh, uh, so, so if you integrate along p, uh, well, along the light ray uh, with tangent vector p, this h here is what you get essentially by integrating this along the null, null ray. 
So this k dot, if, if you take the derivative of this along p dot nabla, you get back to this Hamiltonian here, or this perturbation of the light ray Hamiltonian here. This is now a non-holomorphic. It has a pole at k dot p equals zero. And um, uh, so the, um, uh, the variation in the symplectic potential is just d bar of that. And uh, the, um, so, so we take the definition that d bar of 1 over z for a complex variable is just a delta function supported at z equals 0. This is a delta of the real part of z times the imaginary part of z. Uh, uh, times dz bar. Um, maybe there ought to be one over two pi i here. So the um, so what we get is this um, uh, delta function support at k k dot p equals zero, and uh, uh, th this is crucial for what follows. Um, so you can understand this as just saying that, that if the um, uh, uh, if the light ray is um, transverse to the plane wave, then the oscillation sort of cancels out. There's, it doesn't do much, but if it's in the plane of the plane wave, then uh, uh, it gets shifted an infinite amount as you go through the space-time. Anyway, so this, this is what will give us the vertex operator. Uh, th this is the form of the vertex operator that we'll use, and the um, I guess you could compare it to a standard string one, which would have a epsilon dot dx times epsilon, d bar x. So, 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 so that's a key difference there. And so this, is the, um, this will lead to the uh, scattering equations. And it's these scattering equations that underpin the uh, CHY formula. Lionel, yeah. can, can you derive this by a limit of the standard string vertex operator in some special case for us? Um, the, uh, 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 I'm just wondering whether the scaling argument for the... Um, I mean, this is still a bosonic string argument. So the scaling argument worked for the bosonic string. So I think, I think we, 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 I probably could, yeah. Um, I haven't actually gone through that level of detail. I mean, what, if, well, sorry, I could say later. Another question. Uh, yeah. So is there um, an, um, a way to motivate that delta, that delta function will eventually enforce the scattering equations, right? That's right. So is there a, is there a motivation to impose it like some maybe some geometrical way of imposing it. Well, um, I, I mean here uh, that the Twister point of view. So I, I, I didn't really use this argument first time round. The, the, the first time round, uh, <laughs> I used the Penrose transform using uh, some sheath cohomology short exact sequence. I don't know if that sort of explanation would appeal to you. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, it appealed to me. I mean, it's, it's, what, I, it's, it's, what, it's what I sort of you know, do for a living, so to speak. Uh, um, but then <laughs> so, so I've been trying to translate it in this, at least uh, at Ted's uh, um, suggestion. I tried to translate that in some slightly more physical argument, that the effect of this plane wave is cancelling out when, 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 when you're transverse to the wave and it's oscillating rapidly, but when you're parallel to this, it's, um, uh, uh, it just carries on deforming the geodesic all the way through space-time. Okay, so the... Um, uh, gosh, I'm running out of time. Uh, um, okay, so this is, this is the scattering equations. And just for people who haven't seen what the scattering equations are, you uh, take uh, n null momenta on the sphere, so these are k, uh, ki, so these are meant to be uh, the null momenta for particles that are scattering, so they're uh, first of all, massless, k squared equals zero, and they uh, are conserved. They add up to zero. And um, you write down this p, which is going to be a function on, on the Riemann sphere, uh, whose residues at um, the n mark points uh, are going to be the ki. And the um, uh, you see, what we're going to want is, is that this p squared vanishes. Sorry. I'm, I'm confused. So ki lives in Rd. Yeah. So this Rd has a normal metric whenever delta ij. Sorry, this is a standard uh, space-time. Okay, so then uh, that's, that's a momentum space. k right. square equals zero is k equals zero. If I'm not mistaken, because it's a positive definite metric. No, no, no. Sorry, this is a uh, uh, Minkowski. 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 Sorry. So it's not Rd. It's Rd comma one. Or something. 
Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Does make sense? Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, I get, yeah. By our, I, I, my, my metric had a minus sign in it, or, or, or several of them. Uh, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. So the um, uh, anyway. So, so 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 this this p is 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 the p that I've been talking about all along, um, and um, uh, we're going to want uh, p squared to vanish. One way to do so is to ask that the, um, uh, uh, that the residue at the mark point sigma i should vanish, or p squared. And uh, now, of course, because k squared equals zero, it only has simple poles. And at the residue, you just get k, ki dot p at sigma i. And this gives rise to the famous scattering equations. Well, could you, did you say, and I missed it, why this p is the same p you've been talking about? All along? Uh, well, there's a calculation there that I was, um, uh, that, that I was planning to suppress uh, because they, they, that calculation mm -hmm. is, involves going through all of the... Um, I mean, I can do it. Uh, I do have slides on it, but I was going to suppress it. Could you short say something about it? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, um, Intuitively. So, so, so I think that's in here. So what happens is that when you take all your vertex <laughs> operators, they've got all those factors, the ETI, K dot X, you can take them into the string action here, and um, uh, uh, and, and if you take them in, you, you see they're, they're in the exponential. And uh, so, so if you if you're doing the um, correlation function, you can take these into the uh, uh, e to the i s as part of the string action, and you get k dot x at sigma i. Uh, sigma i is the insertion point of the of the i. Um, there should have been an i there. The i uh, vertex operator. And so you get the field equation d bar x equals zero. So this is a gauge fixed action now. Uh, but you get d bar p is given by a delta function at each of the marks <coughs> the mark points. And um, uh, then um, you integrate that to find, I mean, that's something you've got a pole with this residue at that mark point. So, so, so that, that's, that, that gives you the starting point of uh, what I was saying before. Um, and I guess... Uh, uh, I guess this, this, this slide now tells you what happens um, to the correlator that I, I wrote down before. You get this formula for the, um, uh, um, for, for the correlator for the bosonic string and um, uh, uh, with all the um, uh, delta functions enforcing the scattering equations. Um, uh, although, but these, these are not very nice amplitudes, so um, they, they aren't the ones we want. And uh, in fact, just to make contact with um, the CHY formula, then uh, the CHY formula have these extra factors in there. Uh, they, they tend to write them in two halves, an IL and an IR. They depend on polarization uh, vectors and momentum and the momentum vectors and the solutions to the scattering equations, the sigma i's. And um, uh, so for um, Spin one, you just have one polarization vector. For spin two, you you, you have a, have two, and um, uh, uh, and these satisfy the usual conditions: k dot epsilon equals zero, and so on. And uh, what they do is they they introduce matrices that depend on these um, epsilons and k's, and the solution to the scattering equations. And what you get is this: uh, um, uh, uh, for gravity, you get uh, two Fafians. Uh, one depending on the sort of the left and one depending on the right polarization tensor vectors, and for Yang Mills you get a, one Fafian and a Park Taylor in the. Um... But they also get this master scalar. Right. So, so in fact they have these um, uh, this array <coughs> of theories. So they can do gravity, they can do various things. They get Born-Infeld, dirac born infeld uh, Einstein, Maxwell, Einstein, Yang Mills, five to the fourth, Yang Mills. They do all these other things here, and uh, uh, we can uh, obtain all of those by um, introducing different um, world sheet uh, matter fields. So you can just have uh, uh, one for the left, one for the right, and uh, so Einstein was, was was two of these world sheet supersymmetries. That was a type two theory for Einstein, and uh, uh, here you can read off that there are various other sort of uh, world sheet matter theories you can do, and you can read off the theory for the different types of world sheet matter. Um, and where is the pure phi cubed? Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, the phi cubed was um, 
uh, uh, was, was where we had a um, bad joint scalar. That one down there, bottom right. Were you going to say where out of the ambitwister string these um, these factors, the left and right amplitude factors, come from? Uh, <coughs> I, I wasn't planning to say. Um, so what they uh, where they come from is is that uh, when you have so for Einstein when you have the uh, um, you have these two world sheet supersymmetries, then the vertex operator. Um, you see, the, the, the vertex operator has this ni nice um, feature that it's uh, factorizing. And so if you have the world sheet supersymmetry, epsilon dot p goes to epsilon dot p plus k dot psi times epsilon dot psi. So that's a formula that would be familiar to any string theorist. And uh, the, uh, the Fafians are really just the correlators of, of these fermions. Uh, and, and the epsilon dot p just comes in... Um, the, the matrices that the, the uh, CHY define just naturally incorporate the epsilon dot p as well. So I, I got lost at the, the following step. If you started out saying, well, I start with this Lagrangian and I get the same restrictions on dimension as I do in ordinary string theory. Yeah. But now you're able to use this formalism for a sort of arbitrary d. Where, where did the... Oh, yeah, okay. So the... Um, uh, okay, so the role of the um, anomalies only becomes crucial when you have moduli to integrate over. And that only really happens when you start dealing with Riemann surfaces with... Um, uh, uh, you know, with, with genera, with... So the, the, you see, the modulus of the Riemann sphere is, is, is just a point. In, in so... In normal um, string theory, you have ghosts at three level that don't couple in the covariant stream unless you're in the right number of dimensions, right? Right. Um, but, they, yeah, I guess, I guess the point is that if you're just doing the path integral for the amplitude, the, um, uh, the ambiguity is in the <coughs> and, and But if you're interacting over a point, I guess that would just be a, an overall number. <coughs> you just don't need to think about it in this context. Wait, now I'm completely puzzled. You said a while back that um, gauge fixing and putting in the ghost and insisting the BRST charge squares to zero fixes critical dimension. Yeah. But is that not happening for all of these cases in some maybe modified way? But Yeah, so all of these different theories will have different critical dimensions depending on the kind of choices of matter. Is that what you're asking, Tom? But, uh, but, 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 uh, but I think I think I think uh, I thought Tom was asking the question as to why is it you can write down something that makes sense even off the critical dimension, and I'm trying to argue that the anomalies only mess up your ability to do uh, uh, multi-loop or high genus uh, uh, path integrals. You, you you lose the ability to write down a well-defined measure on the moduli space, of Riemann surfaces. But if you lost Q squared equals zero at tree level, haven't you lost the positive definite uh, Hilbert space metric? That's the question. That's the I guess what we're doing is is we're restricting just to physical ver you know, operate, vertex operators of the um, uh, physical fields, and you're saying that there's maybe some ghost stuff which which you could throw in and which would give you some garbage answer. Uh -huh. But normally, uh, uh, but if you don't do it, you actually get the right answer. Okay. Can you go greater than 26? Well, as far as I know, it works for all D. Yeah. So. Uh, but this is just a massless sector. Yeah. So it, it, it must be because they're, they're taking the string tension to infinity limit on the stuff. Well, where did you actually take the string tension to infinity? Well, I mean, the point is that I, I you know, that, 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 uh, that the motivation coming from taking alpha prime equals zero was something. And construction of string. How does this yeah. differ than, from Whitman's twister string? Okay, well, that's the next slide. So, uh, um, okay, so the point is you can actually start with other formulations of null superparticles. So, uh, that, what I wrote down was that, uh, you, you could start with a super particle p, p dot x dot plus e p, p squared. You know, that's an ordinary world line particle and uh, ordinary world line uh, uh, theory. 
and you know, we're, we're just essentially complexifying it. You, you can do the same for the green Schwarz superparticle. You get a green Schwarz Amitrisis string. And uh, Nathan Berkowitz wrote down a similar one for his pure spinner uh, okay. string. But interestingly enough, the original twister string also fits into this pattern. So the original twister string had a W and a Z. It's just that W uh, vanished uh, uh, on the moduli space. W had negative weights and Z had positive weights, so Z had moduli and W uh, uh, was forced to vanish in, in Whitten's original twister string. There's nothing to have stopped him from going the other way. So his twister string actually had a whole bunch of stuff which was also uh, had W positive weight and Z negative, and so Z was uh, 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 zero and the W was non-zero. And in fact, you can reformulate this in a completely neutral way that so, so, so these are sort of self-dual, these are anti-self-dual, and somehow this all mixed together and gives you a nice uh, twist of string that gives you the right answers for maximally supersymmetric theories. Uh, and, and this w dot dz is p dot dx. It is just in the twister coordinates uh, p dot dx. So this is just the same theory written out in different coordinates. And in fact, you can do it again here, making the w and z spinners on the world, world sheets, and you get a new... Uh, four-dimensional ambi-twister string theory, which gives you correct formulae for Yang, Mills, and gravity, which are much simpler than the ones you get here because there are no moduli, and, uh, um, and they don't require supersymmetry. So in the case of, of uh, Yang, Mills, right, Witten had a formula in term which actually used solutions of the scaring equations. Yes. And that's exactly the same formula? Well, uh, so, so, so the formulae that you get from this, uh, 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 I mean, the easiest proof of these formulae is to go to Witten's formula, uh, which he massa he'd massaged the ones from here quite a long way to get. But even though these are actually still a bit different from that, you still have to do some work. But, uh, it's a bit different, but the answer is the same. Well, it's, it, you, when you're migrating around between different formulae, I mean, it's who, who's to say what's the same and what's not the same with some substitution and so on. It is, it is all essentially the same. So it's, yeah. Um, okay, and uh, uh, so, so that's one geometric realization. Also, the other point is that um, uh, you can use a geometric realization, you know, sort of null geodesics are sort of uh, non locally related to space time, and you can uh, relate them to null infinity. So, um, so the point is that uh, each real null geodesic intersects um, null infinity in the past and in the future, uh, at scry plus and at scry minus. And uh, in flat space, of course, scry plus and scry minus are naturally identified. Uh, just just um, uh, in the conformal compactification, these points are actually the same. But then, of course, in a curved space time, uh, that identifi you know, this identification is really just uh, um, you take the light cone at this point here, and it reconverges at that point there in flat space time. But if there's some non-trivial metric in the interior, then um, uh, that the identification, um, well, th th there is no sensible identification between scry plus and scry minus in, well, I said there's no, no identification that respects the scattering of the physics. And um, uh, uh, you can still define um, uh, 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 the, the ambitwister space in, in curved space time, though, by taking the um, uh, uh, complexification of the cotangent bundle of scry plus, uh, uh, but that's missing quite a lot of the complex algeodesics. Um, and so, so it misses one sort of very complex uh, that, that, that in, intersects scry minus. So, so we get these sort of quite big spaces. Uh, the cotangent bundle scry minus, the cotangent bundle scry plus, uh, uh, but they don't cover the whole space, so you, you, you have to include them both. And uh, in order to glue them, the only sensible way to glue them is by the map that uh, takes the null g digit uh, from scry minus to scry plus, but that will only make sense for the, some small neighborhood of the real light rays. Those are the only ones which will intersect both scry plus and scry minus. The other complex ones are just going only a small amount off into the complex thickening. And uh, so, so if you imagine that um, uh, uh, you're talking about a, a single graviton again, then that, could, that would be generated by some Hamiltonian that generates this whole 
uh, scattering from scry minus to scry plus. Now, the BMS group also acts on scry plus and scry minus, and hence on the cotangent bundle, and uh, they, they, they lift the cotangent bundle with uh, a Hamiltonian action. And uh, so you still have another of these generating functions for the BMS generators. And, um, uh, and, and these, well, you should, you'd write such a thing as a current on the world sheet and you'd do a contour integral. But of course, that's the same thing as just doing, uh, you know, by Stokes' theorem, this is the same thing as doing some integral over the interior of this um, contour of d bar of h. And so you can see that formally it's a, it looks the same as a, uh, uh, a vertex operator. So um, what you discover is that if you take a, a soft graviton, so if you take this formula uh, uh, with k goes to zero, eti k dot x with k goes to zero, then um, this uh, vertex operator really tends towards a super translation generator. <coughs> and the subleading terms in k tend towards uh, super rotations. You just do an expansion and that's what you get. I mean, here now I'm really talking about the gravity theories uh, for this. Um, and so, so this gives you a, a, a way to implement in the world sheet model what um, uh, uh, Lysoff is going to be talking about after uh, uh, a bit later. This, uh, so I don't need to talk about this too much because he'll probably tell you how to do it properly. Uh, but this is the... Um, uh, showing how the Weinberg soft theorem arises as a um, ward identity. Sorry. So you're trying to get to the, argue for the soft graviton theorems from the ambidexter, ambitrister string. That's right. So it's a, this is a world sheet argument. Yeah. So far, you've just discussed the tree of amplitudes. I did just discuss the tree amplitudes. I'll say something about loops just in a moment. Yeah. There's a soft graviton theorem. Right. So these soft, uh, yeah. So, so 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 this is certainly a, a tree level result, and and in fact some of the subleading results were also obtained by looking at the CHY formula and have an interpretation within the Ambly twister string in the same way. Um, and uh, yeah. So I will just say something about loops, but uh, not in so much in the context of the Weinberg theorem. And then. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so, um, uh, so so the quantum gravity loop integrand. Then, so this this ten-dimensional type two gravity model uh, is critical, and uh, uh, and so it does extend to higher, higher genus, and um, uh, so some nice things happen there. So this uh, genus G P is a one form on a um, Riemann surface of genus G. And uh, we, we, you know, it's, it's a standard fact that the um, you know, whilst there's no one forms that are global and holomorphic on the Riemann sphere, um, on genus G you get G uh, one forms, and so that means that uh, you can well, P has an index, has a d-dimensional index, so you actually have d times G zero modes, and these are things that you're going to have to integrate over For, in the I path integral. Sorry, the uh, p squared will be zero, but um, uh, uh, but you see what we're going to have is that p is going to be equal to sum over um, r l r omega r, where omega r is a basis of, the, of some one forms. But there'll also be a sum of k i dot uh, of the external particles times some. Green's function, S sort of Z minus ZI or something. Uh, and so the, this P squared will be zero, but these L's will not. So the um, so this is R equals 1 to G. So, uh, yeah, so omega R is a basis of uh, H1. And uh, so what happens is that the... Um, uh, those LRs acquire the interpretation as being loop momenta uh, at G loops. And um, uh, the, so, so, so I guess, I'm not sure um, how completely rigorously this is proved. I mean, people have written down formally now at uh, uh, two loops and, and 
I'm not sure whether, where they're higher, but the standard string technology can be adapted to write down formally for the path intervals, I, I think, essentially, at an arbitrary loop order. So the sort of thing that you get at one loop will, again, be familiar to a string theorist. At one loop with four particles, uh, you, you obtain a modular invariant sum over spin structures, uh, just as you do for the RNS string, and you get some theta constants, and you get the P... And uh, the, the P squared does vanish, but in order to make it vanish, you have to add uh, 3G minus 3 extra uh, uh, scattering equations uh, fixed at arbitrary <coughs> points on the Riemann surface. But it's independent of the point at which you fix them. And you get Fafians and the scattering equations. So uh, anyway, so certainly the, uh, one loop, this is now checked um, in many ways. And uh, what is sorry? What is checked? Uh, what, what, sorry. What is check? So, okay. So, so, so at four points, one loop, uh, uh, we, we can relate this to the standard loop interbrand. And I, I uh, uh, sorry, not, uh, well, just of um, uh, supergravity in 10 dimensions. And uh, the um, factorization is checked in general. And, but, but, but the, uh, we have a strategy for uh, checking this um, more generally, but it gets it gets a bit complicated. So, so, so what we uh, 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 so, so, so it, is, it is now checked at um, n equals four. There are some nice cancellations in this formula at n equals four. This all this stuff ed, ends up going out, and uh, uh, the um, does a does an exterior factor. So you, you uh, anyway so. Is set to uh, four particles. I think I don't know whether my colleagues have yet done this at five points. So uh, in ten dimensions. Ten dimensions. So anyway, so we, we do believe that, that this this will work. As so, so this and what, and the angles part. Or? There is still uh, I was about to say there is still no critical theory that contains uh, Yang Mills that doesn't have a an unpleasant form of gravity. That's actually not quite true, but the, the Yang Mills has turned out to be more awkward. It's easier to go straight for the gravity. I mean, in the sense that uh, if you try to do the, this for Yang Mills, you get performed gravity? No, um, uh, it, it's worse than that. So the, the, the model that contained Yang Mills was a heterosic model, and the gravity that arose inside the heterosic model turned out to be corrupt. In the same way that the bosonic string was corrupt, the uh, gravity in the heterotic stream is also corrupted. You mean um, it starts out with a higher order. It starts out with a higher order three point uh, at tree <coughs> level. It is like conforming gravity. Uh, it is. Um, is, there but, some, could you say, is there a reason why the output prime to zero limit? Um, you know, you anticipate that it wouldn't work for the heterotic stream. I don't know, but we 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 have a better way of doing Einstein Yang Mills that's come out of the. Um, recent CHY formally, but we haven't actually sort of really checked what loop integrands look like in that case. But I, I think even there, there's, there's something problematic because the, the theory we get isn't sort of... Um, it, it, it probably agrees with the Yang Mills at one loop, but it's... It, it, we still don't have Einstein Yang Mills done in a satisfactory way that, uh, you know, in the sense of having a critical theory for which all of the tree amplitudes uh, work. Should we you expect more than just Yang Mills? I mean, uh, in consistent string theories that have massless fields, both vector and graviton, you also have other fields. So, well, I mean, this this of course has uh, a whole bunch of um, this has a Ramon sector, if that's the sort of thing you're asking, and and that there, there are Ramon vertex operators, uh, and, and so on, and and the Ramon particles. Uh, will be going around the loops here. Can you comment? So normally, well, normally, when I take string theory and I try to take the alpha prime to zero limit inside a loop integral, there are all kinds of places where the, the integral over moduli degenerates, and that generates a sum over a lot of different Feynman diagrams. With here only, set, all and here, solution. somehow, it's you have all. A sum over a solution. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You, you, you still have that sum over solutions well, of the scattering the, equations. So it's the sum over solutions of the scattering equations that yeah. gives me the sum over final. 
So the, the fine, if you're talking about the uh, the uh, super amplitude, four points. It's it's that's, that's right. So so, so we just get boxes. Simple object. That's right. Can you comment more about how the cancellation? That's a complicated object. Uh, yeah, well, I, can, I, I mean, I mean, the strategy is actually quite quite, quite simple here. I mean, the, the strategy is, is to do uh, a residue theorem. So this d tau uh, is is really a um, it's a dq over q, it, where q is it, well. So so q equals zero is is the um, uh, well, Q is the standard e to 2 pi i tau. And yeah, so this is, this, 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 is a, this is a torus. And so, so essentially what happens here is that you, you can see that um, uh, uh, you can use a residue theorem to take off um, uh, essentially this scattering equation. So you remove this one and you can sort of... Um, uh, using the fact that d tau is really dq over q, you can you can you can sort of uh, uh, put the contour on dq over q, and uh, concentrate the integral on q equals zero. And the um, uh, and then when you do that, what you get is um, uh, uh, a Riemann sphere with a um, with a node, and you get scattering equations on that Riemann sphere with a node, and at four points you get six. Yeah, so you've got the other four points. You've essentially got a, a, a room of sphere with six mark points. And you, in fact, there's only two solutions to scattering equations, but they, uh, you can reduce that to a loop integrand that you could recognize. So, uh, and, and we, 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 can, we can do this, uh, I think, systematically at one loop. And we're hoping, we, well, I don't know if we can do it at higher loops, but it's... Um, so, maybe a related uh, question, which... You know, potentially for uh, both you and Svi, is to what extent is this story showing that uh, you know sort of amplitude magic uh, is equivalent to some version of the just the magic just the magic of uh, string perturbation theory? Well, I mean, this is this is what people were trying to do. Uh, you know, so, I, I, so 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 Nathan, I think Berkowitz in particular uh, spent a lot of work trying to do this, and then he got into trouble because people were arguing that the um, uh, the non-perturbative corrections weren't decoupling in the way that um, uh, uh, he had hoped to make the non, non-perturbative in, in what? Well. Uh, um, well, you can probably remember the story a bit better than I can, but the. Sorry, are you talking about the decoupling from gravity? Well, these are these 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 are decoupling non, you know, string degrees of freedom from 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 the you know the massive modes and so on and so on from the super gravity. What you're doing, or at least in some you know theories, you're able to essentially do that. Yeah. So I mean, at the point at this stage, this stuff here is still empirical. Because we, I mean, we, you know, we have a, a, a belief or a hope, wishful thinking, that, that this kind of procedure will give rise to the loop integrand for for all orders, uh, uh, and uh, uh, but we, we certainly don't have the proof of that. Um, so, so this, but, but anyway, but I think Nathan Nathan Berkowitz was trying to argue that good power counting could be seen at least in the pure spinner string, and uh, uh, although he had problems with the um, regularization of his ghost integrals and things. So this has the potential to sort of get, you know, at least some fraction of amplitude magic from the magic of string. Well, I mean, this, 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 this has been the sort of thing we've, we've talked about in more drunken moments, yes. Whether we can make it run, and, and, and these, these sort of integration by parts arguments are great at one loop. You know, you've only got one, you've only got one singularity to get, get, get to. Uh, um, uh, uh, but, but at higher loops, it's, 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 it's going to be hard to... Uh, I mean, in some sense, you only need to sort of do G integration by parts, but um, to get something that, that an argument that really runs to all orders would be um, uh, tough. But, but, so that's just trying to, to uh, cut a line and relate it to a lower point. That's no, I mean, this is, this, this is uh, saying that, that, that you can... See, the point is that this is an integral over a space where, um, I mean, uh, uh, 
Okay, so, so I, guess, I guess if you think about the modular parameter, you see you have the fundamental domain, and uh, in, that mod in that fundamental domain, you've got a whole bunch of solutions to the scattering equations. And, and what you're doing is you've got to add them all up. Now, what you can do is you can take a contour which goes around the fundamental domain, and, uh, uh, and, and that, as that line there goes off to infinity, you can, you can say that the sum of those um, residues there is given by the integral around the cusp. And uh, uh, so, so this is something that you can do at one loop. And I think if we're lucky, we might be able to make this argument run to all numbers of particles at one loop. Uh, but you imagine trying to do that on the genus G moduli space. And, and, and then you're going to start saying, well, uh, I mean, maybe there's some powerful, you know, you ask the lean, and maybe he says, oh, yeah, you just. Uh, Are there issues where the points bump into the, the, the ends of the modular domain? Well, it doesn't really matter because you. Uh, uh, it's modular. Yeah, I mean, the, that's right. I mean, the, the, these, that's the same as that, and this is the same right, as that, right, right. and so on. Yeah. So, so this formula is for the four point equal Yeah, so for five points, you've got some moduli in the fermions. The that appears in that formula is that, oh, it's just four. Uh, Maybe I did put an N somewhere, did I? Yeah, you put an N, but then... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I just realized, I realized when I was looking at the formula that there's some moduli of the fermions that I should have had in there for, for higher N. I mean, that's actually all you need is, is, is the moduli of the fermions. You know? that, then that is all done. Uh, you, you've got the even spin structure to worry about. Anyway, so that's, that's sort of still got quite a long way to go, um, the, 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 the loop stuff. Um, sorry, I didn't want, I mean, I don't know if people had any more questions about the point. Okay, this is, sorry, this is the end. I'm sorry, sorry, actually, I've run on ridiculously long. Um, so. It's okay. We've had a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, so just to, to, just, just to say that these alpha prime equals zero ambi twister strings use Lebrun's uh, ambi twister correspondence to give the theories underlying these CHY formerly old and new. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, I mean, the CHY formally already incorporates a very nice version of color kinematics. And um, uh, there are two things that one might like to learn from this, as to whether you can get some insight into the geometry of the kinematic factors. I don't really, uh, I mean, well, there may be some things that could be said, but I'm not quite sure. But the other thing that's really, I think, holding Zvi and friends up is, 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 is how to extend these things to loops. And, of course, when you go back to that... Um, picture there, you, you see that you've got all sorts of stuff which is not necessarily factorizing so well. I don't know if that... Uh, anyway, so, so, so whether we, this could feed back into the color kinematic story and the program for calculating amplitudes, I don't know. Uh, so the, the quantization ties scattering of null geodesics into that for gravitational waves. I'm, I, I find that quite striking, and then that in turn feeds into these um, insights from null infinity, from the action of the BMS group, and so on. And, um, and at least for the uh, critical models, these, these, these extend to give loop amplitudes. And so, you know, there's still some hope that they'll give some new insights into loop integrands. But I guess, you know, coming here, you know, what about non perturbative story? Or... You know, so the questions people often ask, like, you know, how do you know when you've created a black hole in some scattering amplitude? And in fact, actually already, how much mass have you created? You know, what's the, uh, uh, th these are questions which maybe, maybe we can start to think about. I, don't, I, I, I still don't know how to create a black hole, but I mean, maybe creation of mass <coughs> at the start. I mean, to create a black hole, you've got to get all that mass targeted in a small volume as well, of course. Uh, so, so maybe once you know how to create mass, you can know how to target it. Uh, anyway, so these are things we maybe hope to know. What about uh, deriving this from string theory? Well, okay, so um, I, I got stuck with the type 2 models. So, so, so I, I, and also I think that somebody asked the question as to how to um, even get the vertex operators. I, 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 I sort of feel a bit lazy, actually, that I haven't really done as much work on that as I should have. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure it must work because, it, because the, 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 you know, you're just preserving the action. 
which is all built on, I mean, now it looks like string amplitude. Absolutely, yeah. It's built on the alpha, one goes to zero, so it should be somehow derivable at, the, at that level. Yeah, I mean, I mean it may be, maybe I've just been too lazy, and if I'd worked harder at the type 2 case, then we would actually be able to say how to get it. And then we'd also see why it is the Herr-Schrotter model and the bosonic model, why we're losing stuff or why we're missing something in the heterotic and the bosonic models. So on the previous uh, slide, where did the critical dimension enter? Well, the critical dimension entered, for, for example, um, uh, uh, I think, the, well, the most obvious thing is, is, is in the modularity in the sense that all of the weights of these things had to balance perfectly. So, so the powers that you get here, the e to the 24th, e to the 4th, are all uh, dimension dependent. The, the, the P has, has, has weight. But you know the final formula, of course, so it looks pretty dimension dependent. Um, yes, so I guess, I guess one can then uh, uh, assume, and we do, I guess, that uh, 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 if you wanted to work out maximal supergravity in sort of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 dimensions, you just drop the integer 10 there. Um, so the modular invariance no. plays no role. Well, well, I mean, I think, I think once you've, sorry, this P here is really the L, the L up here. So, 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 so the, the, this, well, actually, yeah, so the modular invariance, that, that, that. I mean, the final form is just the box integral. And but, but the powers of theta depend on T2, right? And eta. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, no, actually, it comes to think of it, the, the, the basis you choose here, uh, yeah, there's a lot of modular stuff going on in here. Which, um, uh, which, which uh, but, but you see these partition function factors here w would come out with different powers if you were working in a different dimension. <coughs> well, I mean, you understand what my comment is that the final formula for the box integral is just the box integral and the integral is just the box integral. So the final formula for the box integral is just the box integral. So the final formula for the box integral is I, I, think, I think once you're on the Riemann sphere, you see, so, 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 so once you've done your integration by parts, then you see, you, you've used modularity to do this contour integral here and push it up to <coughs> tau equals i infinity, or q equals zero. Um, and um, uh, uh, so at that point, th this could be in any dimension. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the modular, uh, yeah, so whether any of the new string theories are modular, I don't know, uh, ambitious string theories are modular is still a question we don't know the answer to. Can the twister ideas be applied in asymptotically anti disitter space? Yes. So, uh, the, the, uh, uh, so, strikingly, it's the twister ones that work well. So, in, in, in the twister one, well, I haven't, I mean, you need to write this out in a bit more detail, but the twister ones, um, oops, uh, the, the twister ones, uh, the, whether it's uh, flat or ADS or desitter, is encoded in, in, a, in, a, in an auxiliary structure. It's not encoded in the base, basic action. Here, here, if you want to put this into a curved background, you can do that, and you get quite a lot of extra stuff in here, and it, and it all gets sort of quite hard to deal with. Uh, the twister one is naturally geared to um, uh, being conformally invariant, and then breaking that conformal invariance down to decisor or anti is is very similar to what you do for flat space. So, yeah, but does that mean that you have a can generate a scattering theory of in asymptotically anti, uh, of in anti disitter space. Well, we have been trying to do that. That there, there have been some glitches, and there are some. I mean, we have some formulae already based on the twister action in anti disitter space for the MHV amplitude, and we are trying to check that against what comes out of these uh, twistorial ambi twister strings, and we're still struggling a bit. I mean, we've, we've been doing that for a while, and it's still. Uh, the, yeah. It's equally easy in the sitter? Well, the, you, you get many more contractions because uh, this infinity twister has low rank in flat space and it has rank, has rank two in flat space, rank four in anti desitter. And uh, the extra contractions uh, just mean the formula just get very long. But it's not clear that the theories still work, so I mean, they're still not checked. And, and that's really what's bugging us. We're getting different formulae which look quite similar. Going from one to the other uh, is, is tough. If you complexify so, space time, there's no difference between this and the other. Well, yeah. 
On the question of the non-perturbative regime, first, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by creation of mass, but if we have a very high energy collision, large center of mass energy, uh, we think we can do what amounts to making black holes, some quantum hmm. version of that. Uh, but then, of course, there's the question of what the story might tell you. And so do you care to hazard any uh, guesses about? Well, these are all rules for perturbation theory. Well, OK, but he put non-perturbative on there. I thought I'd probe that. OK. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, uh, uh, I mean. I, I think I agree. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, mean, I, I, the, I, I mean, I only have flaky ideas. When you go back to this, this story about these uh, super translations, the, uh, the amount of um, super translation, well, so, so, so the mass at I0 uh, um, is related to the kind of uh, infinite super translation between scry plus and scry minus. And, and you can, uh, well, I still don't know about the extent to, it, to which you can measure that, but then. What I do know how to do is, is, is to write down the ambitwister space for Schwarzschild, for example. So I can write down this, um, uh, this picture here. Uh, I, you know, I have the sort of generating function for that gluing. What that buys me and how I can relate that to what's going to come out of the scattering process, I don't know. And, uh, you know, so, so, so you have some logarithmic structure here and some branching and some infinite super translation there. Um, well, uh, these ideas have a long way to go, but I mean, they're, 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 there's some roots into it from, 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 I mean, this is essentially a non-perturbative picture, but then, of course, when you actually start doing calculations on the world sheet, you're, you're, it's difficult to know how to make contact with it. Yeah, I guess there's a question back there. In the, uh... I think it's the last two, pre uh, the previous to last, uh, the uh, four-point function and one of the other one. So uh, you said this is, was checked uh, for, it was checked against the unknown. Yeah. So if I, do you expect this to work also, for example, for any endpoint functions, right? That's what you said? Yeah. Uh, it'll yeah. work something like this? So yeah. if I try, for example, for pi, mm. and uh, if I, for example, take the limit, I, I compute that integral where you take two vertex operators and you pinch them in, you know, to see... Oh, the factorization is checked. Ah, the factorization. That, that, that was checked quite early. For uh, n... I, I, and, and for n particles, yeah. Yeah. We've got another talk in 30 minutes. So yeah, so we should probably wrap up. Thank you very much. <laughs>